Hello everybody, this is Michael Campbell with Glossica, and I'm really excited to sit down today with Ariel Corin. She has a really unique and uh, amazing background, works at Google Translate, also works at Google for Education, has worked in many years uh, with Latin America. She speaks fluent Chinese. I was blown away by her, her Arabic and Hebrew yesterday. Um, a true polyglot, a lover of languages, but more importantly, a lover of people and spreading uh, empowerment for people around the world. Please uh, tell us more about your exciting life. How long have you been at uh, Google and, and, and what is your title there? Yeah, so I've been at Google for four years um, and I've spent part of that time doing community impact work and community impact marketing at Google Translate. And currently I'm on the Google for Education team, which is the team that brings tech solutions to schools and to education institutions. And I'm the marketing lead for one of the regional marketing teams at Google for Education. So you mentioned to me just now that your region is Latin America, right? So you work a lot with Spanish and Portuguese, is that correct? Yeah, I work with some awesome people all across the region who are doing really cool work. And when we talk about language, there's specifically I get to work with a team that does amazing work on language democracy issues and around like making specifically education technology resources more accessible and in this case Spanish and Portuguese. So cool. So how do you how do you uh, envision people and being able to empower them by using the languages that they're learning and going out in the world? Yeah. So this is actually what we've been one of the conversations that we just had at the Polyglot Conference. We were talking about how a lot of people, when they think about like the word polyglot, if they even know what it means, <laughs> they think like nerd, cerebral, intellectual, like someone who's kind of in their own little. I don't know. Bubble. You look pretty cool to me. I don't know. I try. What can I say? What can I say? Um, but we were talking about like how people are kind of in this this, this bubble, and that's the perception. And what we yeah. want is like, and I'm a marketing person, so like a rebrand. We want to okay. rebrand polyglot from being like this kind of insular, even sometimes pretentious person to actually being a language activist. And when right. we talk about language activist. We talk about someone who focuses a concentrated amount of energy and passion toward promoting and celebrating and protecting language diversity and language democracy, right? So that's what we've been talking about during this conference. It's a lot of conversations that we're having. How can we become language activists? How can we become people who look at the ways that language underpins injustices, that language, lack of language what access, are, lack of language democracy? What is an example of injustices that you see? Oh gosh, I mean, this could be a really long conversation. Um, but just to kind of bring it home to everybody, you know, look, what other specific examples you can give us? I can give a lot of examples. Let's talk first about the internet, just specifically okay. the internet, right? At Google, we like to say that the internet, and particularly our tools, are supposed to serve to make all of the world's information organized and universally accessible. And the internet is supposed to be a tool that democratizes information and access to information. But 50% of the internet's content is in just 10 languages. Mm. And mm -hmm. English alone accounts for, excuse me, 80% of the world's internet content is in 10 languages. Okay. And English, 80%, right. and English accounts for 50% of that. So 50% of the world's internet content is in English, which is a language that is only understood by 20% of the world's population. So 50% of 80% is actually 90% of all information is in English. 50% yeah. of, the, of the world's internet content okay. is in English. Okay. 10 languages account for 80% 80 of the okay. world's internet content. Right, so I had it backwards. Exactly, so you have this language that 20 percent of the world's population can actually understand, not right. even necessarily speaks it natively, but can understand it. And one of the things that we were just talking about in, this, in the presentation that I was giving is that in the United States, which is the country that has the most, the highest population of migrants in the entire world, 19 percent of the world's migrant population is based in the United States, okay? In the United States, wouldn't our expectation, or at least our hope, at this point not expectation, but our hope, be that a country that is so at the receiving end of so much migration that this country would be doing a lot of capacity building around language competency and around culture competency? Instead, the federal government gives zero dollars mm. to initiatives to promote multilingualism amongst mm. youth in the United States, and 85% of public high school students in the United States do not ever step into a foreign language classroom until high school. So well. how can we spread you know, uh, good to society and help people be more uh, accepting 
of um, of people in general, you know? Oh, I mean, I don't think I'm the one to answer that question, but in terms of blank, how do we spread good out of the blanket level? Um, I could talk, obviously, to the language piece, which is what we're talking here. One of the things that we were talking about in the presentation is around this idea of language activism. And one of the key pillars of language activism is um, when you're looking at an injustice or you're observing an injustice, be it in the news, be it on the local level, the global level, are we interrogating the ways that language underpins that justice or is injustice or is used as a tool to further that injustice? So like one example is the fact that asylum seekers both, well let's talk like specifically in the United States, are required to fill out all of their paperwork just in English. Asylum? Asylum seekers. People asylum are, seekers, people okay. Are, so they're required to fill out their paperwork in English. All of the paperwork that asylum seekers have to fill out is only available in English. This is happening in 2019. It's a discrimination it's problem. A discrimination it's about making problem. it's about using language as a tool to make asylum which is already nearly impossible to get in the United States even more impossible to get. And it's something that's happening in 2019, but that's been happening. I just talked about this um, in the presentation, but it's been happening literally since the Holocaust when asylum seekers who were fleeing the Holocaust were arriving to the United States and the State Department, which was under explicitly and notoriously anti-Semitic leadership, implemented a visa application form that was eight feet long and available only in English. So printed in tiny print, eight feet long, available only in English. And like Holocaust historians look back at this, and there's a famous historian whose name is David Wyman, who described this as paper walls that meant the difference between life and death. So everyone right now is talking about wow. the literal walls that are designed to limit people's fundamental human right to freedom of mobility, but as language people, and at this conference, at the Polyglot Conference, I think we should be talking also about like word walls and language walls and paper walls, because language yeah. is used as a tool for oppression, and yeah. as language activists, we have the power to darle la vuelta, to kind of spin that around and use language as a tool for healing, for empowering, right. for service. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who said it, but um, somebody said the, the word is, is mightier than the sword. And so it can be used both for good and, and also for, for quite a lot of evil as well. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure having you uh, here today and getting a chance to talk to you. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, would be I would love to hear more about all of the updates um, you have in the future. Do you, uh, is there a place where people can follow you on Twitter or other social media? Do you post? Yeah, definitely. And also, let me just um, say that we have this crisis translation response network that we haven't talked about. But if you're watching and you're someone who's multilingual or has language skills and you're passionate about using those language skills to make a difference, go to Respond crisis translation.org and sign up to be a volunteer translator for people who are experiencing crisis and need translation in, in an emergency setting or in an emergency situation. Respond respond crisis translation.org okay. so that would be great yeah thank you very much thanks so much